Hi everybody, I am going to talk about the models of disability. Models of disability provide social case workers a basis for systematic approach to understand the causes and contexts of disability. These models are also tools for defining impairment and ultimately providing the basis for the government and non-government sectors to devise strategies for meeting the needs of individuals with disabilities. These models are essentially devised by people about those people who have some forms of disability. They provide an insight into the attitudes, conceptions and prejudices of the former and how they impact on the latter. Hence, these models reveal the ways in which our society provides the people with the disabilities the opportunities for availing suitable services, economic opportunities and political power or limit the access to all such opportunities. In general, the models of disability are influenced by two fundamental philosophies. The first one perceives the people with disability as dependents upon the society. This perception can result in paternalism, segregation and discrimination. The second type of philosophy views people with disability as customers of what the society has to offer. This leads to choice, empowerment, equality of human rights and integration. It is important that these models are a series of exclusive options with one superior to or replacing previous sets. Their development and popularity provides a continuum on changing social attitudes to disability at a given time. Models change as society changes. By examining the different models of disability, one can explore the degree to which each philosophy has been applied. At the end of this talk, you may understand the various models and their theoretical frameworks, learn the relationship of these models for social work practice, and become aware of the roles that models of disability can play over a period of time in providing both the theoretical and practical support for the interventions chosen for people with disability. There are four major models of disability, namely the medical model, the social model, the transactional model, and the ecological or systems model. Let me discuss about these models of disability starting with a medical model. The medical model of disability is probably the most influential and pervasive model today due to the power and prestige of the medical professionals, insurers and institutions on whose perspectives, expertise and influence the medical model is based upon. The medical model couches disability in the context of pathology and impairment such as sensory, neurological or cognitive impairment from a trauma or disease process. This model assumes that the impairment arises from symptoms due to a disorder, syndrome, disease or condition that is subsequently categorized and classified. The goals of the medical model are the prevention, intervention and management of the disease processes and traumas. Interventions based on this model have much to commend them from the standpoint of the child with a disability and his or her social worker. The environmental and social factors are more responsible for creating a disabling condition in a person with disability. Ultimately, this causes psychological disturbances. 
Ignoring these responsible factors of disabling conditions and giving priority to the physical conditions does not yield better results. Hence, there are reasons to state that physical condition of disability is only very minimal when compared to the environmental, social and psychological factors associated with the disabling conditions. Let me state some of the disadvantages of the medical model. The medical model of disability that is grounded in the assessment of individual pathology provides a useful framework for intervention only to the extent to which there is some indication of underlying pathogenic process. Some developmental disabilities such as mental retardation resulting from identifiable genetic anomalies such as Down syndrome or fragile X syndrome are based on a clearly measurable medical diagnostic procedure. Other disabilities such as autism spectrum disorders are based on the observation of behavioral attributes of the child while in a clinical setting and often result in an unclear or tentative assessment. For many developmental disabilities, even when a clear medical assessment is established, there is no single demonstrably effective medical intervention to alleviate the cause or the symptoms of the disability. Thus, parents often have the assessment at hand but do not know what to do next. The practitioners fail to provide counseling to the parents and as a result, the parents are in utter confusion and they develop negative attitude towards the model and confine their children to the four walls of the house, giving less priority to the process of intervention. One of the consequences of this model is that it creates negative attitude in people and also leads to stigmatization, discrimination and exclusion. Disability in the context of the medical model extends beyond the condition of disability to encompass the experience and consequences of disability, both of which are intimately tied to another concept, functioning or what the individual is able to do irrespective of the assessment. The distinction between the level of assessment and functioning is not a trivial one for several reasons. Studies have shown that assessment may not be the best predictor of functioning for people with a disability. Moreover, assessment or diagnosis is not a good predictor of service need, but functioning mediates the impact of assessment on need. The missing link between the assessment and the need is functioning. This observation is particularly true for children with developmental disabilities. All disabilities cannot be treated medically after a series of assessments. For many disabilities, pathogenic conditions may not be the causative factor. Medical assessment together with functional assessment can aid in arriving at right decision. Let me explain about the social model of disability. The social model takes functioning into consideration and provides a framework for understanding how the social environment has an impact on functioning and consequently on the service needs. The social model looks at disability as a consequence of environmental, social and attitudinal barriers that prevent people with disabilities from maximum participation and involvement in the mainstream society. It is best summarized in the definition of disability from the Disabled Peoples International. The loss or limitation of opportunities to take part in the normal life of the community on an equal level with others due to physical or social barriers. The social model of disability states that disability is a social construction 
which is to say that society creates disability by imposing hindrances to the full participation of persons with the different abilities. Such hindrances include negative attitudes, physical impediments and institutional communication and social barriers. In the social model, disability is differentiated from impairment by exclusionary societal practices that isolate and stigmatize individuals with a disability. The proponents of the social model of disability observe that society unjustly privileges certain appearances, levels of functioning or needs as normal over others, resulting in social exclusion as well as economic and political marginalization. Those who do not conform to the behavior, needs or aesthetics expected of non-disabled people are treated as inferior and considered to have subnormal status. Similarly, society weighs the rights of the individual and the responsibilities of the community differently depending on the consequences to the dominant non-disabled group. Within this framework, the appropriate accommodations needed for persons with disabilities to participate fully in society are affirmed as their rights. In practice, however, the boundaries of such rights have been the subject of heated debates when public and private entities have been challenged with the costly alterations to standard practices or services. For young children with disability, this debate may take shape when mainstreaming children assessed with a cerebral palsy or Down syndrome that requires additional teacher training and a teacher's aid for every integrated classroom. The social model places the accommodation needs of children with disability on an equal footing with those of their non-disabled peers. The social model also recognizes the important role of the institutional, social and political environment in facilitating or impeding conditions that outchafe such rights. Perhaps even more than the medical model, the social model requires the knowledge and participation of parents and social workers in order to craft an appropriate child-specific intervention for each child with the disability. The importance of informed parental input into the intervention process needs to be acknowledged. The social model permits consideration of social class, ethnic and cultural biases and discriminations. Disparities in access to care, service provider and cultural barriers increase the risk factors for aggravating the condition and consequences of developmental disabilities over the lifespan. Thus, the social model can add a needed dimension to the intervention and related services that are usually thought of as the exclusive purview of the medical model. Just as the medical model emphasizes prevention and timely remedial intervention, the social model espouses proactive measures to anticipate and reduce barriers to full participation in the institutional, social and political environment as a young child moves from home to preschool and preschool to school environments. The social model complements the micro or the individual focus of the medical model with a macro level perspective. Unfortunately, neither the medical nor the social model properly accounts for the meso-level activities that mediate both the effects of physiological or psychological impairments and the effects of institutional policies or practices. At the meso-level, the interactions of children with disabilities and their families with institutions such as schools and social service agencies, transpersonal factors 
such as interpersonal and family influence the children's quality of life. The transactional model provides a framework for conceptualizing how these dynamics affect the experience of disability for the child and his or her support system. The transactional model posits multiple feedback loops between the behavioral patterns, beliefs and emotional reactions of the child with the disability and his or her immediate social environment. Thus, it takes into account the way in which the interaction between a child with an autism spectrum disorder and his or her parents produce reciprocal responses that shape the child's self-presentation and self-esteem with clear implications for the child's experience of disability when he or she enters the school environment. Let me explain the systems model. In order to consider all the three elements, namely individual, societal and transpersonal simultaneously, an ecological approach is required. In their search for ecologically valid models of disability for research and clinical application with the children, Llewellyn and Hogan suggest a systems analysis model guided by Braun Fernbrenner's process person context model. Braun Fernbrenner's model attributes individual characteristics to the joint effect of personal traits and environmental factors over the lifespan. His ecological or systems theory was based upon the earlier work of Kurt Lewin who devised the field theory approach to human behavior. Lewin observed that explaining human behavior by reference to the action of the human psyche alone constituted an unwarranted solipsism. It means that behavior could not adequately be understood simply in terms of cognitive structures, wishes and expectations and that some way would have to be found for dealing with the constraints, opportunities, resources and pressures that originate in the social, political and technological environment. The basis of Lewin's field theory posited a life space at the intersection of person and environment. This life space was a region, partly accessible and partly not, in which the individual interacted with his or her environment and structured the individual's psychological experience. Thus, field theory placed outcomes in the context of a structure and process. Braun von Brunner added another dimension to Lewin's field theory. Lewin insisted that person-environment interaction should focus on a snapshot in time, whereas Braun von Brunner was interested in the changing interaction over time. Lewin was focused chiefly on individual behavior as shaped by small group social interactions rather than on large social problems, but Braun von Brenner supported the application of field theory to macro level environments. Braun von Brenner devoted his energies to developing a framework suitable for conceptualizing the environment in concentric circles of influence from the most proximal relationship with the individual to its most distal and in-between. Let me now briefly explain the professional model of disability. This model has provided a traditional response to disability issues and can be seen as an offshoot of the medical model. Within its framework, 
Professionals follow a process of identifying the impairment and its limitations using the medical model and taking the necessary action to improve the position of the disabled person. This has tended to produce a system in which an authoritarian overactive service provider prescribes and acts for a passive client. This is also called an expert model. Let me just mention about the charity model of disability. This model depicts the disabled people as victims of circumstance who deserve pity. This, along with the medical model, is the model most used by non-disabled people to define and explain disability. Charity organizations have been set up for many years, managed and run by non-disabled people and most of them are often impairment specific. These non-disabled people who are involved in helping the disabled through charities often do so because of a loved one, a friend or a calling to do service to humanity. They act and speak for the disabled with the mindset that they know what is right and good for the disabled. The charity approach of organizations has led to the disabled people being controlled and dictated to about what is best for them. Thus, there is lack of empowerment for the disabled, a fact that can be corroborated with the number of disabled persons who are involved in the management and the employment structure of the charity. Children with disabilities continue to struggle against stereotypes by charities run by non-disabled people. Disabled children may be placed in charity-run schools and institutions which can increase feelings of isolation, otherness and disempowerment. By and large, the charity model of disability has attracted some criticism. First of all, the disabled people are not involved in the matters of administration and decision making. Charity organizations which are impairment specific contributed to the segregation of the disabled people. They reinforce certain negative stereotypes of disabled people particularly through advertising and marketing. These organizations themselves benefit as much if not more than the people they claim to be helping and that they receive a positive image as part of this process while the disabled people are once again portrayed as needy and pitiable. Charity model is linked closely to the medical model focusing on the disability rather than the person which implies that the disabled person is at fault rather than the society. However, things are slowly beginning to improve and charity organizations are beginning to shift from the charity model of disability. There is a clear move towards a rights model where disabled people are being empowered, emancipated and enabled by the organizations. The disabled persons are becoming active members of such charity organizations where the focus is increasingly on the rights of the disabled people to be fully integrated into society. Awareness campaigns are beginning to focus on how the society needs to change rather than the disabled persons and their disabilities. The moral model of disability refers to the attitude that people are morally responsible for their own disability. For example, the disability may be seen as a result of the bad actions of one's parents if congenital or as a result of practicing witchcraft. This attitude may also be viewed as a religious fundamentalist offshoot 
of the original animal roots of human beings when humans killed any baby that could not survive on its own in the wild. Echoes of this streak of attitude can be seen in the doctrine of karma in Indian religions. Next is a legitimacy model of disability. The legitimacy model of disability views disability as a value-based determination about which explanations for the atypical or legitimate for membership in the disability category. This viewpoint allows for multiple explanations and models to be considered as purposive and viable. I would like to tell you about the empowering model of disability. The empowering model of disability allows a person with a disability and his or her family to decide the course of the intervention or treatment and what services they wish to benefit from. This, in turn, turns a professional into a service provider whose role is to offer guidance and carry out the client's decisions. In other words, this model empowers the individual to pursue his or her own goal. Next is a socially adapted model of disability. This model states that although a person's disability poses some limitations in an able-bodied society, often the surrounding society and environment are more limiting than the disability itself. The economic model of disability defines disability as a person's inability to participate in work. It also assesses the degree to which impairment affects an individual's productivity and the economic consequences for the individual, employer and the state. Such consequences include the loss of earnings and payment for assistance by the individual, lower profit margins for the employer and state welfare payments. This model is directly related to the charity or tragedy model. Let me sum up. The models of disability are tools for defining impairment and ultimately providing the basis for the governmental and non-governmental sectors to devise strategies for meeting the needs of individuals with disabilities. There are four major models of disability, namely the medical model, the social model, the transactional model, and the ecological or systems model. The models of disability can play a significant role in providing both theoretical and practical support for the interventions and services chosen by parents in consultation with the social workers and other professionals for children with disabilities. There are also other models of disability such as the professional model of disability, the charity model of disability, the moral model of disability, the legitimacy model of disability, the empowering model of disability, the socially adapted model of disability, the economic model of disability, and the market model of disability. Let me sign off now and hope to see you in another session. Thank you.